This is a, a video that I wanted to put together for a while to try to help educate um, you know, all of my patients about certain lifestyle choices you can make on a regular basis um, that will help decrease the inflammation and pain that you're coming to see me for today. Um, you know, a lot of the things that happen in our body are just the natural consequences of being a human being. I tell everyone, you know, we are all we all suffer from the human, you know, the, the human condition, and and we all are going to succumb to the aches and pains that come with age. Uh, our bodies are um, incredibly complex machines, and um, machines wear out and parts break. And that's just that's just the nature of life. So. Um, there are a ton of things that you can do uh, just in your overall lifestyle, though, uh, that will help decrease the inflammation and pain that you feel. And I try to think of this as kind of the anti-inflammatory lifestyle, right? And just to begin with, what is inflammation? Well, inflammation is a naturally occurring process that happens in our bodies when, when our body senses an injury or some sort of insult. And it sends uh, many, many chemical messages to that area uh, to help heal the problem, but also it elucidates pain. The, the, the problem is that sometimes that system is is out of whack, um, and and a lot of the things that we do in our bodies and our lifestyle can make it uh, so it's almost um, hypersensitive, so to speak. So it's taking something that's a relatively small insult and making you feel like it's something much bigger than it is um, for various reasons. So I like to try to educate people on the anti-inflammatory lifestyle. And for me, this consists of five things. And I, the, the acronym that I have in my head for this, I just call it the MESH D, right? <laughs> or DMESH, DMESH of living. And it's diet, meditation, exercise, sleep, and hydration, right? So we're gonna start off with diet. How do you utilize diet to decrease the pain that you're feeling in your shoulder, right? So um, I'm a huge proponent of the anti-inflammatory diet. So I'll start with things that you should avoid, right? And so, or, or decrease radically in your diet. The first thing would be processed sugars, right? So anything that has a high content of sugar, that's soft drinks, uh, many, many processed foods, uh, a lot of sweets, candies, things like that. You wanna almost completely eliminate those from your diet or decrease them radically, right? And I'm not saying you could never have a piece of pie again or never have candy again. You just don't want to be eating that on a regular basis. It needs to be something that you either have a small amount of each day and it's planned and you say, I'm going to have this at this time, or maybe even just a couple days a week. Um, starches, right? So white starchy carbs, so white breads, white rices, you know, things like that. You want to decrease the amounts of white starchy carbs. You have white pastas. Those things can increase the inflammation in our bodies. Just processed foods in general, you know, anything that's packaged, you know, think of a Twinkie, right? Like read the back of a Twinkie. There's a lot of chemicals in there. Um, and, and I'm not saying those chemicals are bad, honestly. Like I I don't believe that a lot of it has to do with the chemicals that they're putting in them. I think it's because the caloric load. Like if you take a processed food and you compare it to a natural whole food, there's just way more calories in that processed food. And they've actually looked at this and studied this. And, and that's what they've really found is that it's, it's as simple as that is, if we eat many, many processed foods, we're just consuming way more calories in smaller packages than if we eat a big salad or you know you go eat a bunch of avocados or something natural. You just get more calories and, and it's the volume, right? Like the food is smaller and tighter. And so you can just put more calories in a smaller thing. So you just consume more calories. Um, but other things to think about are saturated fats. And saturated fats, the way I remember this when we learned in biochemistry and medical school are solids, right? So, you know, butters, um, and I'm, you can still have some butter, but don't be eating like a pound a day. Um, you know, really, really fatty cuts of steak, like brisket, things like that. You wanna make those like special occasions. Like that can't be like a core part of your diet. So you wanna avoid the saturated solid fats. You wanna decrease processed foods. You wanna decrease starch. You wanna decrease sugar. Another one is alcohol, right? Um, you know, there are some studies out there that say having one glass of wine a day, red wine can uh, decrease the risk of cardiac disease and, and, and overall have healthy living. I, I, I do agree with those studies and there's enough data to say that it's not bad for you. There's not enough data to say that if you don't drink every day that you should start drinking every day. Uh, but I think that one should be the max, right? Like one should be the max. Maybe two if you're like a gigantic human being, but really it's one for a woman, two for a man, and that should be averaged across seven days, right? So. You know, some people, they don't drink during the week and maybe they have like five or six drinks on the weekend at night and, and that's gonna affect you, right? You're gonna have hangovers and, and decreased 
function. Uh, but you want to, if you're if you're someone that really likes to have a, a drink a day, keep it to one drink. You don't want to be having two, three, four drinks every day. Um, and if you look at how much you're drinking in a week, you really don't want to be consuming more than like seven to ten drinks in a week. If you look at your lifestyle and you say, "Wow, I drink two or three drinks every night," um, and then on the weekends I have four or five, and you say, "Wow," when you look at each week, I'm adding it up, and I'm having like thirty drinks a week. That's too much alcohol, right? Like it's just. It's, it's, it's not good for your mind, it's not good for your body, it's not good for everything in your lifestyle. So try to cut the alcohol down to where you're really averaging around seven to 10, maybe 12 drinks a week, and you're gonna decrease the inflammation in your body, right? So what should you eat? Well, just in general, plants. Plants are great, right? So anything that grows on a tree is good for you. And uh, in terms of vegetables, you know, broccoli is awesome, spinach is great, leafy green vegetables, you know, like really, really light. You know, romaine lettuce is better than iceberg lettuce. Just think like the darker and the more green it is, the more nutrients you're gonna have. Um, in terms of proteins, chicken and fish are awesome. I'm not anti-red meat. I think red meat's awesome. It has a ton of nutrients in it. You just wanna eat leaner red meats, right? You don't wanna be eating a ribeye steak every night. Um, you wanna be eating like leaner cuts. If you get ground beef, get the 10%, uh, not the you know not the 20 or 30% ground beef. Um, you know, if you're eating steaks, try to eat leaner cuts of steaks on a regular basis. Um, but chicken, fish, steak, all those things are great. Uh, fish, I mean, go crazy. You want to eat fish as much as you possibly can. It has omega-3s in it. It's very, very healthy for you and very healthy fats. Um, in terms of oil and things like that, olive oils and coconut oils tend to be a little bit better for you than um, butters uh, and shortening when you're, when you're flavoring your foods. Um, whole eggs are good for you. They do have a high level of cholesterol, so you don't want to be eating like 10 a day. But one or two whole eggs is, they have... If you don't eat the, the yolk of the egg, you're throwing, you're kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, right? Because there's so many nutrients in, in a whole egg that having a couple of eggs a few days a week is awesome for your diet and awesome for your mind. Like these are powerful brain foods too. Um, avocados are a wonderful vegetable or fruit. I'm not really sure if you would want to call those things, but I would think of it as a vegetable. But um, avocados are awesome for you. They have you know tons of omega-3s, very, very healthy fats. In terms of fruits, people want to go crazy with the fruits sometimes because they, they're dieting, so they, they like the sweetness of the fruits. So if you do need to have that sweetness, I mean, blueberries and strawberries are the best for you. Uh, it's lower on the glycemic index. It's not going to spike your sugar as much. Um, bananas and dates are a little bit higher sugar, so you want to be careful with those, but but they do have tons of potassium in them. So if you want to have something sweet, you know, once a day, uh, you want to, you know, it's better to, to flavor and get sweetness with like bananas and dates and things like that if you're making a smoothie. Um, almonds are great. Almond butter is awesome. Super high in the calories, but if you want to have just, if you're, if you're needing that fat or those calories, like almond butter is great. Um, dark chocolate is a powerful brain food. I mean, they've looked at this many, many times and studied this. It's wonderful for your mind and your function. It's got tons of antioxidants. You want dark, dark chocolate though, right? Like it's not milk chocolate. It's the darker chocolate with higher percentages of cocoa in it. It's a little bit more bitter. And you also don't want to be eating like a pound a night. I mean, like a small bite or two is what you need in order to get the health benefits of it. Um, red wine, if you're going to drink alcohol, red wine has tons of antioxidants. Uh, and, and things that are good for your body. You just don't want to be drinking a bottle a night. You know, one glass is good. So those are kind of like the power foods that I would stick with. Uh, another part of your diet that I think is, is huge is fasting. Um, this has been extremely beneficial for me personally. Um, I, you know, I, with, the, with the stressors of life, it, it takes a lot of energy to eat and live a healthy lifestyle and eat clean. Um, there's tons of pressures in our world, you know, with family and work and jobs and stress and life and traveling and all that stuff where it's very easy to slip in the habit of eating unhealthy foods because they taste great and, and you want them and it's easier to eat that way. Um, so it takes a lot of discipline in order to try to eat healthy foods all the time. And so what I have found is just for me personally, and, and I'm not saying this is for everybody, but I eat one meal a day. Um, and by eating one meal a day, it, it drastically decreases my caloric load. Uh, my energy levels stay consistent. I had to build up to this. And I don't do it all the time. I just do it most of the time. Um, and uh, it's kept my calorie load really low because it's hard to eat, you know, more than 2,000 calories in a day for eating one meal a day. Um, you know, um, the benefits of fasting are that you can get into a catabolic state and you can get yourself in a negative caloric deficit, which is the key to all this, right? Like you just need to get, you need to be burning more calories than you're taking in. And, and when you get in that catabolic state where you're, you know, the, the burning is, is less than the fuel that's coming in, 
you will feel better. Your body will release endorphins and chemicals that help decrease inflammation in your body. You'll have more energy. Um, and, and fasting is a great way to do that. If you want to start small, you can just skip a meal, right? Skip breakfast. Everybody said break, you have to have breakfast. That's not true. There's no there's no data support that you, you have to have breakfast. Um, you could then go to skipping lunch and then and try it. Uh, if you have diabetes or any other medical issues where you're taking prescription medicines for anything at all, right? You need to talk with your PCP first before you try this and, and ask them about doing intermittent fasting. Uh, and there are people that stretch this out for long, long periods where they go two, three days without consuming food. Uh, and they're just drinking like teas and um, really, really low calorie things or, or almost nothing um, and just hydrating themselves. And there, this has been studied for, since the 1950s to show that this is a safe thing to do. What they haven't seen is that um, other than just losing weight, it's um, incredibly beneficial for your body in a lot of ways. It, it's almost like it kind of resets your system. And when your body starts noticing that it's it need it's not getting calories, it um, it kind of just refocuses your body, refocuses your mind. So uh, I would try it and see. Uh, most people think, you know, it's kind of crazy at first, but it's just like running a marathon, right? Like if you've never run before, you can't go run 26 miles. You start off by running down the street and then the next day you go a little bit more. And so the th same thing with fasting, um, you, you build up to it. And But I will tell you, it's been one of the most beneficial things I've ever started. And it was actually recommended to me by another orthopedic surgeon for the purposes of just like anti, you know, just decreasing the aching and pain in your body. Uh, and it's been awesome. So uh, I, I would recommend you try that. Um, and the keys to be able to do it are um, staying hydrated and exercising throughout the day. I mean, light exercise and hydration are gonna be the keys to helping you maintain that. Um, uh, yeah, you gotta make sure you stay hydrated. Make sure you stay hydrated and, and when you get hungry, you know, go for a light walk, that'll help kind of fight through it. And the hunger that you feel when you're, when you're fasting, it actually comes in waves, right? Like you'll get, you'll, you, you will feel spikes of hunger, but it doesn't stay like that for like eight hours. You actually will have it for like 30, 40 minutes and then it goes away. Uh, it's interesting how your body kind of resets and gets used to that. So I would strongly recommend you try it. It's been really, really, it's been a, it's been one of the best things I've ever done. Uh, so exercise, that leads me to exercise. So uh, exercise is the most powerful uh, analgesic known to man, right? So we do lots of surgeries, lots of treatments, drugs, all these things that we do to help decrease your pain. Exercise is one of the most potent things that you can do to help decrease your pain. The endorphins that get released when you exercise are powerful, right? They decrease the inflammation, decrease the pain in your body. You know, pain is is a very interesting phenomenon in that, um, you know, we, we treat pain and we see pain all day, every day as orthopedic surgeons, but the way that the human mind perceives pain and, and how it affects people is radically different. And it's and we're still trying to figure this out with neuroscience and, and a lot of the data that's coming out now. But what we do know is that stress levels increase the pain that you feel and perceive as a human being, right? So if you're more stressed, whatever your aches and pains are, just go up two or three notches, right? I always tell patients, you know, stress doesn't create rotator cuff tears, but it definitely makes them hurt more, right? And a lot of times you're stressed because you're in pain, which increases your pain, which increases your stress, right? So how can we decrease that pain and decrease that stress? Well, exercise, right? Like it's got so many benefits. It's every human being on earth should be exercising every single day for 20 minutes, right? You After 20 minutes of intense exercise, you, you what you're doing now is just burning more calories or, or achieving whatever goal you wanna do. But in terms of like the core hardcore health benefits that you get from it, 20 minutes is all you need to get all the amazing benefits. Now it needs to be fairly vigorous exercise, right? Like if you're not doing vigorous exercise, maybe you need to be doing 30, 40 minutes, but I'm talking heart rate is is, is up there. You're, I, I just tell patients, you wanna be just covered in sweat when you're done. If you could do something every day where after 20 minutes you're covered in sweat, you've achieved your goal of exercise and you're gonna get all the benefits. And, and the benefits are massive, right? Like you get increased energy, right? You get increased focus, you get decreased stress, you get decreased pain, right? And, and then what does that do? If you, if you decrease your stress, you decrease your pain, well, you decrease your stress and you decrease your pain. It just goes like this. You increase your energy, you increase your focus. Now, a lot of us tell ourselves that I can't exercise because I don't have the energy and I don't have the time, right? However, if you exercise, you increase your energy and you increase your focus. That allows you to get more done in less time, right? You get more done in less time if you have more energy and more focus. Every single one of us in the world can be more productive as human beings, right? You can always do more in less time. 
it requires you think about what you're doing, but it's, it's none of us is, is, is operating at maximum capacity. It's not possible. It's, there's always more you can do. So if, if you exercise just 20 minutes a day, what you're going to find is that you can get more done in less time, which decreases your stress. So, so being too busy is never an option, right? Like you just get up earlier or you do it sometime during the day, 20 minutes. Any human being on earth can exercise for 20 minutes. Uh, a lot of you come to see us as with big surgeons because you have a lot of aches and pains. So um, different things you can do. Power walking is great, right? But you got to be walking quick enough to get your heart rate up. Uh, a light jog if, if your knees or hips can handle it. Uh, elliptical machine is great. I love riding a stationary bike. Um, I still exercise and do a lot of resistance training, but like my my 20 minutes a day that I get no matter what is on a stationary bike at my house and I just ride it really hard. The first thing I do when I get up in the morning and it it, it totally resets my system and, and sets the, the tone for the day for me. So uh, I think also you need to create a habit where it's built into your schedule to where you know you're gonna do it. And early in the morning is probably best because then the day doesn't get away with you and you can't make a bunch of excuses to not get it done. You know, if you do your exercise first thing in the morning, the likelihood of you getting it done is way higher. Um, uh, stationary bike, rowing machine, skier machine, swimming, yoga, Pilates, light rubber band work. I mean, you name it, just you need to move in some sort of way for 20 minutes a day. And if you do that, you're gonna decrease your stress, you're gonna decrease your pain, you're gonna overall just feel better as a human being. Sleep, so sleep's another big one. Uh, you got to get to bed on night, at night every time at the same time. Wake up at the same time. Uh, an hour before bed, you want to shut off all screens. All screens. So there's blue light, blue wavelength light that comes in and, and with iPhones and computers and, and, and smart TVs, and it disrupts your circadian rhythms. And so you want to avoid that at least an hour before bed. And so what should you do in that hour? Well, you should open up a book and read a book. I think that's a, that's a great way to help calm your mind down. And, and get yourself ready for bed. I think journaling is great. Uh, sitting down with a piece of paper and planning your next day. But don't watch TV, don't look at your phone, don't look at the computer an hour before bed. It's gonna help you sleep much better. And then also going to bed at the same time and waking up at the same time is gonna help you massively. Um, I think that um, also with sleep, you wanna make sure that your room is very cold and very dark, right? So very cold, very dark. Those things help. Weighted blankets to help, you know, mess with the comfort of your bed. But those are kind of my main sleep tips. Uh, the other um, thing to talk about with anti-inflammation is meditation. Uh, a lot of people maybe balk at that, say, you know, how is meditation going to help me? Um, well, just doing five to ten minutes of meditation a day, where you just sit in a quiet room uh, or an area and just follow your breath. It, what it's doing is it's training your mind to focus, and by focusing on your breath, your uh, being able to train your brain to um, uh, remove distractions, which improves your focus overall as a human being and doesn't let um, thoughts and um, emotions overtake you. And when it comes to pain specifically, uh, pain is a sensation that we feel, but it creates emotions and stressful emotions that we then attach to that pain. And by being able to separate the two and saying like, I feel this pain, right? Like if you smash my toe with a hammer, I'm going to feel it. But all the stress and things that go along with that. You have a choice on how you want to let that overtake your mind. And, and by meditating on a regular basis, you can kind of take the pain and you can't make it go away completely, but you can decrease the stress that it causes you, which will actually decrease how much pain you feel and how much it impacts you negatively as a human being, right? Also, meditating every day just increases your overall focus and productivity as a human being. And this has been studied extensively. People that meditate for five to 10 minutes a day, even after six weeks, they do fMRI studies where they look at their brain and see how it gets rewired. And, and those people have um, much, much less stress in their minds. The, the parts of their brain that, that get fired up from getting stressed go down significantly. Uh, the last thing that I wanna talk about is hydration. You wanna be, make sure you're drinking six to eight cups of water a day. Uh, especially if you're doing the fasting and the exercising, it's difficult, you know, when you get busy to, to not remind yourself to drink water throughout the day, but a, a real, a key, an easy way to do it. And they trained us when I played football in college, it was real, they gave us a chart and it was actually looking at your urine and it was like how dark it can be and all these things. Just keep, if your urine's light, you're hydrated, right? So you want to have light urine throughout the day. If it ever gets even slightly dark, you don't have enough water in your system. So always keep your urine light throughout the day. Um, especially in the hotter times of the year and, and if you're drinking alcohol and, and exercising a lot, for sure, crank it up. Um, 
And so those are kind of my overall anti-inflammatory tips. Um, if I had to pick one of them out of all of them, exercise is number one, right? Because it gives you so many benefits. And a lot of times in order to make these lifestyle changes, you got to pick one thing, just pick one thing. And it creates this domino effect that allows you to start. If you try to do everything at once, you'll do nothing. So if I had to pick one, I'd pick the exercise on a regular basis. And that in turn will propel you into making all these other changes. And, and honestly, it, it, it's going to help you feel better as a human being and decrease your pain. And um, that's it. So thank you very much.